Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Translating Europe Forum. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Translate Europe My Forum. Is Aminda Lee. I'm a British and now, thanks to Brexit, Italian journalist and moderator. <laughs> I worked for many years at the BBC before moving to Rome, where I also have a small translation business, uh, which uh, concentrates on film and television. My name is Nicolas Froleger. I'm a former professional translator. I founded a small translation agency, and uh, I'm responsible for the EMT masters, uh, including specialized translation at the University of Paris. And today, I'm also going to be speaking as a member of the EMT, the European Masters of Translation, and uh, elected to its board in October. Hosts and moderators at this sixth showcase event, organized by the European Commission's Directorate General for Translation. Alors, traduire le... Translating Europe, well, what's that about? Well, the idea is to bring together professionals and those interested in translation from all aspects of this diverse profession. Today with us, uh, we have representatives of agencies, and we have freelance translations, we have uh, the academic world with us, international organizations, public, uh, national public administrations. We also have students, uh, EMT students. Uh, we have uh, trainees at uh, the Commission's DG Translation with us, or at other EU institutions, we have representatives of, of the media and others. This is actually even wider than that because the proceedings are being streamed live on the web. So we give an especially warm welcome to those of you tuning in from afar. Et bien sûr. And of course, given that we're talking about, about translation in all its aspects, we have interpreters working with us uh, here in the booths around the room and they will be doing their best to facilitate communication. Now there will our headphones in front of you. Channel one is German, channel two is English, good morning to you all, and channel three is French. Interpretation on the live web streaming. Now normally in conferences people thank the interpreters right at the end. But since we're talking about translation, we know how important their job is. So I'd like everybody to please give a big round of applause and thank you to the interpreters. So the topic for this year's TEF is translation all around us. And I don't know about you, but it certainly made me think about a famous song from the 1990s featured in hit movies like Four Weddings and a Funeral and Love Actually. But I digress, uh, because in the next two days we will be exploring the added value of translation in business and society. Indeed, where there are languages, there is translation. And given that there are more than 7,000 languages in the world, it's inevitable that translation is everywhere. Languages are, we find translation from food labels to film subtitles, mobile phone manuals to hotel reservation websites, restaurant menus to train platforms. And when translation is not there, whether it be for traveling or whether in business, for example, we really miss it and reminded of its vital role. This year's Translation Europe Forum, we want to explore the ways in which translation and language services bring added value to society, not just in purely monetary terms, but also in terms of human values. It will be interesting to hear what the panels on translation in healthcare and crisis translation uh, have to say about this, for example. Now, I'm going to start by asking you all to check that your mobile phones are on silent during our sessions. But please keep them handy because we're going to be using them for a number of things. Now, if you wish, you can, you can log on to the Commission's Wi-Fi network and the code, you'll find it printed on the back of your badge. It's also 
is also displayed on the screen behind us. Line. You're all actively encouraged to tweet uh, what you hear. The hashtag is, as you can see behind us, uh, 2019 TEF, and share your thoughts with the wider world. To make this forum as interactive as possible, we're also using an online platform called Slido during the proceedings. I'd like to do an old-fashioned uh, survey, tech way, hands up. Who's used Slido before? Okay, a fair number of people. For the others who haven't, don't worry, we'll be taking you through it. Uh, we'll be using Slido for several things during this event. You can send in questions. I see that someone already, already sent us a question in asking how we are today. Uh, I'm good, thank you very much indeed, and I hope you are too. Um, you'll be able to vote on other people's questions, and obviously the ones with more votes we'll be uh, trying to address in the sessions. Uh, and uh, we'll be creating polls so you can answer questions and we can see the temperature of the room. Uh, and we'll be creating word clouds together as well. And people watching on the web streaming, they can also participate in Slido activities too. Please make your views heard. Et justement, nous allons... And indeed, we'll be giving you the opportunity shortly. I'm going to ask those of you who wish to to go onto the site www.slido.com and uh, then enter the event code which is hash 2019 TEF that's the event code for today it's the same as the Twitter hashtag which will keep things simple so if you have the Slido app on your smartphone, that is the code that you'll use on the app as well to connect to this event. Once again, you'll find um, the code on the back of your badge. Shall we have a go now, quickly, just to see, get into the swing of it and see how it works in practice? Uh, I'd like to start with Word Cloud 1, as we call it, uh, where I'd like you to send in one word describing what you're hoping to get out of this 2019 Translating Europe Forum. You can send in as many one-word responses as you like, and the more people that send in one word, the same word, the bigger that word becomes on our screen. So you'll start seeing it. There you are. Inspiration's already getting very uh, nice and big there. And, of course, you watching on the web streaming, uh, following us live, please send in your words as well. Um, okay, knowledge, inspiration, networking, ideas. We've uh, getting. We'll, we'll leave it open for a little bit. Oui, c'est tout à fait en cours. Well, yes, that's very encouraging. So while you enter your keywords, we've got a number of practical points as well to pass on to you. Now, outside of this room, there's. Uh, Networking Village, as you know, networking is very important for the translating pr profession. And there are a number of stands, and we warmly invite you to go and visit these various stands. Uh, of course, during the coffee break and the lunch break, that is. Make sure that you're back in the room on time after each break, also because it means the online participants know when to tune in. And one last thing, um, if you hear bells at 12.30, it's a fire alarm test. Don't worry, you don't need to evacuate the building. Si c'est à midi, par contre... But if it's not uh, at 12.30, then yes, maybe you do. So, now's the time, perhaps, to take a look at our first word cloud, networking, knowledge, inspiration. Uh, I'm quite reassured, I have to say, compared to other word clouds that I've seen uh, translation sociologists uh, putting together. I can see that here there's quite an optimistic atmosphere amongst translators here. And I think that's our role as well, to try to um, keep that optimism tangible, increase your motivation. And we also have satisfaction, 
exchange. I'm just looking to see if there are some negative words there, but I can't see any at all, which is great, isn't it? Everyone's got uh, good vibes in this room this morning. That's really good. And we will hopefully take them on and hopefully we will exceed, uh, if not meet, uh, these desires that you express here. And we'll find out at the end of the conference how it all met, how it all went. So thank you very much to the technicians. We can close our word cloud now. And I think at this point, it's probably a good moment to start to get down to business. And we're delighted that the European Commissioner for Budget and Human Resources, who is, of course, in charge of translation as well, Gunther Ottinger, is here to open the conference. He's going to be introduced by the event's host in the form of Veritas Martikonis, who is Director General at DG Translation. Please give him a warm round of applause. Commissioner, uh, colleagues, um, thank you so much for, for being there. You see, when entering the room, um, I, I, I saw Nicola standing on the podium, um, giving me exactly what one of the key words was um, just um, slidoed, and that is inspiration. When I looked at, at the outfit of uh, a professor from, from Paris University, I said, this is an inspiration. You know, being so, uh, for so many times, you know, every time in, in gray suits, you know, I, I thought, you know, this is how the profession should uh, shine sometimes. And since we are not allowed to comment on the, on the other gender um, outfits, and I, I'm complimenting you, Nicola, and, and thank you greatly, both for starting and, and for creating the atmospherics, which is so contrasting the rainy Brussels, but this is in the best of the traditions of TEF, which we always do in November, and this is one of the least inspiring months in, in, in Belgium. But here we are, here we are. And I, I'm not to introduce uh, Commissioner Ottinger, because he does not need, I, I think, much of introduction. Um, I, I can only say thank you, Commissioner, that in your busy schedules um, you have got this half an hour to spend with us and to say the, the, all the important things of introduction were, were said, who is in this room? In, in this room we have people who are making sure that translation plays its uh, role both as business but also as something which contributes to the society. And in the topic, when we say translation all around us, we are capturing something which we thought that for this year, we need to address the, the narratives, the narratives of the societal change, which we are all facing, and also the translation and, and professional change, which contributes to that. And the, the fact that we are not sort of struggling, we are not uh, fighting, but we are facing, we are embracing, and we are contributing to the change which we all are part of. And in that sense, um, if we talk society, if we talk politics, Commissioner Ottinger um, has an important role to play in, in it, in European politics, in European budgets, and this is something, Commissioner, that we would be very much delighted to hear from you, from your perspective, where we are with European politics, with the uh, European state of affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Commissioner Günther Ottinger. Director General, Mr. Martikonis, moderators, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the European Commission and uh, say thank you to all for taking part in this sixth Translating Europe Forum event. Congratulations to DG Translation and everyone who has been involved. Now, you work as translators, interpreters from various international organizations or 
you're here perhaps uh, because you study languages or you represent universities and you want to become a, uh, an interpreter or a translator. You're all here. And I think that the program that you will be following today and tomorrow together will be very valuable. And it will help to strengthen the European Union as well. Europe was, is, and will be a multilingual continent. And 46% of all European citizens still only speak their mother tongue and they don't speak a second language. So almost half of Europe's citizens here on the European continent is either limited in terms of communication or because of you, because of translators and interpreters, they can communicate with each other. Europe is the continent of freedom of movement for people. People can decide where they want to live and work right across Europe. Freedom of movement for goods and services as well. The single market is one decisive pillar. Freedom of movement of uh, goods and services from one member state to another or for people who want to decide where they want to study, work or retire, all of that requires multilingualism and skills. Now, if you don't want to end up with a Tower of Babel where communication failed, well then, if you want a Europe which has real freedom of movement, where you have one market uh, where people can are free to travel right across it, well then you need to optimize communication, and that's what and that's where you come in. And we're not just talking about the economy and the single market here. We're talking about helping people to understand each other, and that means democracy as well. Democracy at the European level. We have the European Parliament, the Council, the European Commission, the Committee of the Regions, the Economic and Social Committee, and the other institutions such as the courts, the Court of Auditors, the Court of Justice, the Ombudsman. All of these, if they are to be accepted, need to have what uh, is uh, said or written there translated. Every citizen has the right to interact with the European institutions in their mother tongue and to get a proper answer in their mother tongue as well on what their inquiry was, their complaint, their question or their criticism, whatever it is. 23, 24 languages, that's what we have. Now, if the United Kingdom does leave in January, English will remain perhaps the most important language on the European continent. That's why your work is so important and necessary for the single market, therefore for freedom of movement and for our economic strength, but for much more than that as well, to help people understand each other in the real, the true meaning of the word and for democracy as well. If Europe is going to work in a credible way and we're going to have quality work done. Now we all know, and uh, some people are concerned about the fact that machine learning and artificial intelligence means that a lot is possible electronically or digitally, things that previously were the preserve of human beings, such as translation, for example, or even simultaneous interpretation. But legislation and politics relies on precision. Now, if you look at a regulation or a directive from the European Union, well, the figures are clear, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, minus 10%, whatever it is, plus 30%. Figures are the same wherever you are on the European continent, but letters aren't. And the meaning of words are even less clear. And if you take a regulation which uh, has gone through Parliament and gone through the trilogue and Council, now if all of that happened in English, all of the discussions and debates were only in English, well then you need to make sure that uh, it's, well, it ends up being easier said than done, in fact, to have everyone understanding 
that English in the same way. You end up with gray zones, and um, what you would end up with is that the suddenly, when you're trying to interpret a piece of legislation in Polish, in Swedish, uh, in Italian, then um, perhaps that version wouldn't end up being quite as clear as the original English version, and then it would perhaps be up to the European Court of Justice to uh, really interpret a piece of legislation, because after all, we are governed by the rule of law, and our laws are, after all, binding on all of Europe's citizens. And if that's the case, which it is, then you need absolute precision. And that's why you are part and parcel of European policymaking and part of European the European legislative process. Multilingualism is uh, part of our history. It is uh, culturally very valuable. Now, it could be that dialects will lose ground and uh, lose significance, but languages, our languages will still be part of people's upbringing, part of people's education, part of our communication for generations to come. And that's why a multilingual, a multilingual continent will rely on qualified translators and qualified interpreters in the future too. And if, I think uh, looking globally, that can be an advantage because in Europe, we have English, French, Ita Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Polish and German. And if you speak some of those languages in Europe, that means that some Europeans um, have a real advantage in the rest of the world, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Mexico, in countries which perhaps used to be French colonies or Italian colonies. European nationals have an advantage because European languages are world languages uh, in many cases. And so that means those people who speak those languages c can also operate in Brazil, in Argentina, or in other countries in the world as well. Multilingualism can be a real advantage in international communication and international competition. Now, in Council, we'll be having a trilogue on the draft budget 2020, the uh, budget for an uncertain period. And I'm always doing my best to make sure that we have a proper budget for our colleagues working in DG Translation and DG Skik, the interpretation department, to make sure that they remain an attractive, attractive employers and that fair work is uh, rewarded by fair pay and we can retain well-qualified translators and interpreters and we can recruit new staff as an attractive employer. And I do my best to maintain that. And so um, when you're talking to finance ministers who believe that you can just cut the European budget, I would ask you to convince them that your work was, is, and will remain very valuable. And for our economy and our democracy, your services are absolutely essential. Now, when it comes to the multi-annual multi financial framework, when we are negotiating that for the next decade, I will do what I can to make sure that the budget for DG Translation and for DG Skik is maintained so that the European Union and all the European institutions have an opportunity to maintain these services and restock them with new officials and new staff in the years to come. The European project is at risk. In recent months and years, we've seen that uh, we've seen the rise of nationalists, neo-nationalists, and populists who wish to weaken or destroy Europe and autocrats from elsewhere in the world don't like the European Union. In Ankara, in Moscow, and uh, some tweets from the White House do sound quite autocratic as well. And those forces, they don't like the European Union. They want to divide and rule. That's why we need to understand 
that Europe which is either 27 or 28 member states strong and uh, which will be welcoming, I hope, uh, some countries from the Western Balkans uh, sooner or later, and that we remain united and that nobody is able to divide us. Europe is made up of two groups of member states. One group, it, those are countries, countries which know that they're small, and the other group of member states are countries which are also small but don't know it. Now, my friend uh, D.G. Martikonis, in his country, people know that their country is small. And that's why the large majority are enthusiastic Europeans. Now, in that country where, in the country where I was born, some people know, but not all. No, but Deutsch, Germany is Germany is also a dwarf. Uh, all European countries are dwarfs, you could call them, and it's only if uh, we work together that we can be a giant. But uh, you know, as a team, we're five hundred and ten million countries. If you add um, Norway, Switzerland, um, and Liechtenstein and the other uh, associated countries, then you end up with a very strong single market with uh, freedom of movement and a lot of material and other advantages which Europe has um, uh, built up since the Second World War that was uh, started by Germany and lost by Germany. And uh, since then, we have built up a great deal together and achieved a great deal together. And you have made a decisive contribution to that because if you understand other countries' languages, you understand other countries' history as well. You understand the religion or the origin, the culture of other people if you understand the language. Language is the key to understanding other peoples. And if you do that, you're not just interpreters or translators, you're diplomats as well. You're uh, helping to build the European project. Thank you very much, and uh, I really wish you the very best for your conference. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I found it personally very inspiring uh, that um, we have such a vital role uh, to play as translators in the future of Europe. Uh, really, it came across very, very clearly. Thank you, Commissioner. So, it's now time to start an opening speech, um, our keynote speech, which is being given today by David Gemellity. He's going to be examining how translators can create added value in corporate and institutional environments. Dave, as he likes to be called, is head of translations at BCV, or Banque Cantonale Vaudoise. It's the fifth largest bank in Switzerland, and he leads an in-house team of six tra staff translators and another six on-site contractors who mainly work between French, English, and German. Over the last 15 years, Dave and his team have established a more ambitious model for translation at BCV, and it has paid off. At a time, as we all know, when many other in-house uh, translation departments are being downsized or even scrapped and outsourced, his team has been expanded in 2015 and again in 2018. So Dave clearly has a few things to tell us about corporate survival skills for translators. And there's even more. Unlike many translation teams that are often marginalized in their companies, living in buildings that are far away from everywhere else, etc., etc., uh, BCV's translators have managed to position themselves at the center of the bank's decision making when it comes to communication. So the translators, and this I find remarkable, have regular face to face meetings with the bank's CEO and CFO to discuss the wording of critical translated content, for example, the bank's financial results. Very few corporate translators have that kind of access to top management, and Dave will explain how his team have managed to open those doors. But perhaps the most concrete sign of the translator's central role in the bank's communications came in 2015. BCV decided to put Dave, who is an English speaker who translates 
into English, in charge of the creative team that developed a new French language brand identity campaign for the bank. That campaign went on to win two industry awards. This goes to show that it is possible for translators to earn a seat at the table where strategic communication questions are being discussed and decided. So, let's hear about the approach that Dave and his team used to get that seat at the table. Please give a warm welcome to Dave Gemellity. Hi, everyone. Translators generally don't get much say in the source text, right? I mean, there are some exceptions. Everyone hearing me okay? Once in a while, you can get something changed in a source text, like if they made a factual error. You might find yourself emailing a client wealth management firm with something like that. Is that Greek thing too soon for you guys? Sorry about that. It's just an example. That's the kind of change we translators can get changed, right, in a source text. Fixing a factual error. You send them that, you point it out, and they let you make the change. And if it's not too late, they change the source text too. <laughs> and they love you for it. They love you for it. They say, Nobody reads a text like a translator reads a text. And you know what? They're probably right. <laughs> On the other hand, do you, as the translator, have any say at all in the question about why they're talking about Greece in the first place? Or why their flagship wealth management brochure is full of opaque passages on technical topics like sovereign debt yield curves, or why their flagship wealth management brochure is over 50 soul-destroying pages long? <laughs> no. As a translator, you generally don't have any say at all in any of that, right? All those sorts of big picture communications questions are as a rule settled before we translators get involved. I'm talking about questions like what the company's brand story is and you know how they try to tell a story that's a little different from the other company's stories to differentiate themselves, what the company's strategic communications objectives for that particular year or three year period might be, whether the company adopts a product based hard sell with CTAs calls to action, like buy one, get one free, or a brand-based soft sell with fluffy slogans, like you never really own a Patek Philippe timepiece, you merely take care of it for the next generation. Right? I love the merely there, I love that. It's a perfect choice of word. And the fact that some of you might be thinking it's a little bit precious, just shows that it's a perfect choice of word for that particular brand story. I mean, it wouldn't work so well for a hard sell call to action, right? Imagine Nike saying, merely to. <laughs> right. Can you see that? <laughs> Me neither. Which brings us to another big picture question that generally gets decided before we translators get involved. Corporate tone of voice, right? That's what Monzo calls it. At Google, they call it their voice principles. At BCV, we call it the charte editoriale. But you know what I mean. What I mean is whether you're going to be a merely company or a just company. Whether you're going to be a watch company or a timepiece company, right? Um, I'm also talking about questions like whether your company's messaging is visuals driven <coughs> or copy driven, right? And 
If it's the latter, you know, whether that copy is actually edgy enough to capture the public's attention, right? The public generally prefers image-based advertising, whether that copy is in line with the rest of your brand identity as well, your brand voice, you know, whether you can do that. Um, they clearly appear to be capable of being edgy enough. It's a bank in Texas. Their copy is in line with their visual approach and vice versa. Now, see how all these things fit together and how they all connect to the writing to what we do. But we're not yet quite finished, right? Because there's also the question of how your messaging is mixed among earned, bought, shared, owned media, right? And, and, and how it has to be adapted as a function of the particularities of each of those channels. How, you know, that influences the actual words on the page or on the screen or in somebody's earbuds, right? We translators generally don't have a seat at the table for most of those big picture conversations about a, film, a firm's or an organization's overall approach to communicating. That stuff gets decided before we come in. Often, we're not even really briefed on it. Which is a shame, because that stuff could clearly be useful for a translator to know about, right? I mean, preferably in great detail. As we've just seen, it all connects to the writing, to what we do. So knowing about it could help you unwitting avoid unwittingly transforming your just company into a merely company or your timepiece company into a watch company. It can help you keep your translations on message. And as Aminda said, the, the in-house translation team I'm on did actually manage to gradually get a seat at the table where those things get talked about and even to some extent decided. But we had to work for it hard for about a decade because we did not start from a position of strength. As a matter of fact, BCV's in-house translation team coalesced in the 1990s out of a, as, as a simple offshoot of a program my bank had set up to provide language lessons for bankers, right? BCV's very first translators were language teachers. And even when I joined the bank about a decade later, there was still a perception in the bank we were still thought of as language services people rather than communications people. And the distinction's important because that means there isn't so much of a perception that you need to be looped in on any of that big picture communication stuff, right? In fact, as a BCV translator back in the early aughts, the, the first years of the, of, of the last decade, it was even sometimes difficult to get information about the texts you'd been asked to translate. Our internal clients seemed to assume that translation was just, you know, something that happened, right? And it made it tough to get them to agree, to brief you, to do any Q&A with you about the source text. Now let me ask you, does that situation sound familiar to anybody in here? <laughs> Thinking maybe it might. So as a BCV translator back then, since your clients didn't really want to deal with your questions, and since you didn't want to antagonize people, What'd you do? You were always tempted to raise the threshold for what Q&A you considered to be absolutely necessary to get the target text right. In other words, you know, you tried to figure out how to do translating without asking questions. Again, am I sounding familiar here? Am I ringing any bells? Now, is this working? Doesn't seem like it yet. Yeah. Keep going. Here's the thing. As a translation process choice, because that's what it is, raising that threshold for what Q&A you consider to be absolutely necessary to get your target text right equates almost mathematically with raising your threshold for bad writing in your target text, raising your tolerance threshold, right? That is a simple fact.
And it has negative long-term consequences as well, because I think raising that threshold for when you think you need Q&A to get it right also will tend over the long term to dull your skills as a writer in your target language. It's a fundamentally low ambition process choice. So that's a brief taste of what, oh, sorry about that. That's a brief taste of what our translation processes were like at BCV 10 or 15 years ago. And our translation product, you know, the actual translations, about what you'd think with processes like that. And our positioning within the bank. Let's just say we mostly got noticed when stuff went wrong. Am I sounding familiar here again? And then we got downsized in a reorg, which is what happens when you're marginalized within your organization. Coming out of that reorg, we realized we had to do a better job communicating our added value, which brings me to the theme of this conference. That said, before you worry about communicating your added value, you better think hard about whether you're creating as much of it as you could. Remember, for companies, organizations, and the people who run them, the added value is in effective communication across their languages. That's the goal. The added value for the people who are running the organizations we work for is not in translation per se. Translation is a means to an end for these guys. That end is effective communication. So if we want to create maximum added value for these people, we need to think in terms of that end. We need to think in terms of their bigger picture. Our processes need to be designed with that end in mind, and our product needs to be judged on those terms, which means that our unspoken, tacit quality standard, the quality question we ask ourselves about the work we're doing, can no longer be, is this a good translation? It needs to be, is this effective communication? And that's a higher bar, because it takes away the excuse of the source text. It means you need to design translation processes that are in line with that more ambitious goal. And ours weren't at BCV, not back then. As I said, we weren't doing as much Q&A as we should have been. I claimed, I asserted, just a couple minutes ago, that that particular process decision, doing without Q&A, equates to raising your tolerance threshold for kind of middling writing in your translations. Now I'd like to show you what I mean. There's a tiny little bit of French in this example, but you don't need to understand the French. It's just there for reference. And there it is. So just have a look, essentially, at the English there. This inside front cover blurb is the very first thing you see when you open up that Swiss tech company's annual report. That's a spot where a tech company would typically want to present a modern, innovative, decisive, dynamic brand image, which the English copy is not doing. It's ineffective writing, essentially for lack of verbs. And the problem, of course, here, and that's why I did put the French in, is that all the verbs have been nominalized in French, right? A really typical problem from just about any Romance language into English. The verbs to pass and to transform, well, they're not conjugated in the French, so you haven't got a subject, you haven't got agency, you don't know who did it. You're not going to be able to write a sentence with a verb in English. You could guess, did the individual divisions transform themselves? <laughs> or did corporate reorg them? Who knows? Or could you just say we, right? Because that's what a tech firm in Silicon Valley might say. Right? And this Swiss tech firm might very well be trying to channel that Silicon Valley vibe in their brand voice. Or they might not. 
You don't know because you're not briefed, you're not in the loop, and Q&A isn't part of your process. Now, that was actually translated a few years ago by real live human translators. The term for them apparently is bio-translators. I learned that last night. Um, but, as a matter of fact, if you put it into an NMT app, a neural machine translation app, like Google Translate or DeepL, it'll come out pretty much the same. That is to say, NMT output, neural machine translation output, produces about the same thing as human professionals who do not have Q&A as part of their process, at least in this case. And the result is a fail in terms of corporate communication. However, if your translation process does include getting some face time with the text owner, you can get the verbs in there and help that company project that more dyna dynamic, innovative brand image. And if your process includes that meeting with the text owner, you can use that meeting to get some other things. As you talk with the text owner about these choices, you can start getting yourself in the loop on the company's big picture corporate communications brand voice strategy. You can also pitch some ideas that you think might help her communicate for her company more effectively in English. You can bring in some examples of Anglo annual reports of firms from the tech space or from other sectors. And you can show her that in the Anglosphere, corporate annual reports tend to strike a more personal tone than they do in the Gallosphere. Like here, with all of those we's and us's and ours. You can suggest, you know, based on examples like that, that if she wants her English annual report to be effective as corporate financial communication, then the subject of the two sentences in your blurb, and probably a bunch of other sentences in that annual report, probably should be just we, right? Um, and here's another thing. For her, that slide functions as a sort of rough and ready benchmark. I know we translators call them parallel texts, but business people think of those as benchmarks. And the thing is, if you make your pitch with benchmarks, you're going to have a much better chance of convincing her than you would if you simply asserted it. Now, she'll be in a hurry, like all these C-suite people are, right? So you do need to be efficient. Pace is one of the most important meeting skills you can have in a business setting. What that means here is, you know those slides you want to use? You better make sure that they're quickly deployable and visually straightforward. If you are flipping through a 60 page long printout looking for the right example, you're dead. I've seen it happen. It's painful to watch. But if you do it right, You've made your point in 10 seconds, and then you can move from something like that to something like that, which I submit would be a win in terms of corporate communication, and also satisfying for you personally because the writing is so much better. But all of that is predicated on thinking hard upstream about how you want that meeting to go and what you need to do to make sure that meeting does go that way. Meetings are something you have to prepare for beforehand and something you can debrief afterward. They're something you can get better at. You should fuss lovingly over meetings in the same way you fuss lovingly over your translations. Today, when we go into a Q&A meeting at BCV, we have two main goals. First, we're trying to execute on that commitment to no excuses effective communication in the target text. Remember, that means no taking the source text as an excuse. If the source text is intractable in spots, well, hey, that's why you asked for the meeting. So you come in there, you throw out possibilities, options, reformulations, and then you sift through them together with the corporate executive you're with, you work it out. Now, the result of that meeting 
might be a message slightly different from the source text message. But it's still on message. The meeting has ensured that. And now the writing's good too. The second goal we have, I'm just gonna get that out of my hair. The second goal we have for Q&A meetings is to position ourselves with our clients as experts who know their field, who know how it sounds in the target language. We want them to think of us as the people who can help them fine tune their communications in that language and in that field. So in these meetings, we're actually aiming to manage both the actual quality of the translations itself, is it effective communication, am I happy with it as writing, and the perceived quality of the translations. Does the person across the table from me buy in to what I'm doing? Too many translators forget to manage that second dimension of quality. Too many translation teams forget to mention that second, to, to manage that second dimension of quality. Buy-in, perceived quality. It's a crucial corporate survival skill. Now, if you've managed perceived quality well in a meeting, your client, well, she's bought in. She's going to walk out of that meeting, and maybe she'll see her boss, and maybe she'll say, her boss, someone you cannot get a meeting with. And she'll say, yeah, we had a really productive meeting with the translators today. Look at some of the solutions we came up with. And then you know what? Maybe from now on, you can get a meeting with her boss. Seriously. That's how we did it. That's exactly how we worked our way up over a period of about five or six years, to meetings with our CEO whenever we do our yearly results. We did that by fussing over meetings. In fact, we fuss over all our processes. We fuss over them to best align them with that high ambition mindset. No excuses, effective communication. Target text that work is writing, is communication no matter what. We want translation processes that help us show our added value. Because in a meeting like that, you're showing it. That way you don't have to tell it, right? Showing is always better than telling. One other thing. None of this will work unless you know the field you're working in. You will perhaps have noticed that I said field, not fields, which tips my hand a little bit, doesn't it? I think that we translators as a group tend to be a little bit naive and a little bit self-indulgent about specialization, about what true specialization really means, and about what our prospects are as individuals and as a profession in an, area, uh, in an era of increasingly good automated translation if we do not commit to specialization, to true specialization. The thing is, specialization is a fact of economic life. And in most other branches of the economy, specializing in a field means working in that field, that one field, 40 hours a week for years. And that, in turn, implies giving up on other fields, making choices, saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that translation for you. It's not my field. You don't go to a gastroenterologist for a knee operation. And you don't go to an international arbitration lawyer for your divorce settlement. And if you did, they'd turn you down. They'd say, hey, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's not my field. So why is it that so many translators think they can do divorce law on Monday, gastroenterology on Tuesday, 
the financials of a bank annual report on Wednesday, a Bordeaux wine guide on Thursday, and take Friday off. As one of the hallmark characteristics of our profession, and it is, our collective unwillingness to specialize in a meaningful sense of the word is probably one of the causes of the disconnect between translator culture and business culture. And there is one. Helen Kelly Holmes of the University of Limerick has looked at the way translation is depicted in business school marketing textbooks. And it ain't pretty. Business people tend to see translation largely as a source of expense and risk. And what I'm saying to you guys today is that that image is perhaps not entirely undeserved. We create risk for business people by working in fields that we should not be working in. At the University of Geneva's translation faculty, FTI, I co-teach a course that's called transcreation. Well, it's not. It's a course on transcreation, but it's not called transcreation. It's called transcreation and finance because it would make no sense to have a class on transcreation and everything. You've got to make choices. In that class, the students spend most of the semester acquiring field-specific knowledge in just a few very tightly delimited areas of finance and marketing before we let them so much as transcreate their first word. You've got to make choices. But then, at the end, they team up and they work on case studies. And some of the stuff these students produce is so good, so fantastic, that I want to buy it for the bank. We actually are buying some next week. It's that field-specific knowledge that, that actually enfranchises you as a writer, as a trans-creator, as a translator, that enables you to be a convincing ventriloquist of a specific field, that enables you in that face-to-face -face meeting with a client, even if she's a native speaker, especially if she's a native speaker, and that happens more and more, right, in the globalized labor, labor market, to really be impressive in the way that you can throw out field-specific options, field-specific solutions for wording in a highly specialized field. You want to get to the point in terms of both your knowledge of the field and your knowledge of your company's big picture communications issues, where you feel like you could practically start you know, writing the content yourself. And, and as Aminda said, that's kind of where we got it, BCV, both in the target language and in the case of that brand identity campaign that I work on, in the source language. Now, when you start to pull together all the processes that follow from that high ambition mindset, that mindset where you've said to yourself, what would I need to do in terms of processes to be able to turn out target text that I am happy with? is writing. And I've only been able to talk about one or two today. There's a lot of moving parts, obviously. When you pull together all those processes, you end up being able to do some translations that are pretty personally satisfying, which is also important, right? I mean, the job's got to be fun. For instance, you know, taking something like that, which is the actual inside front cover of our flagship wealth management brochure from a few years ago, so that's all there is on the first page, taking that and rendering it as that. Or more prosaically, translating this little blurb in a quarterly results press release, which says you know, that our financial results are underpinned by literally the confidence or trust um, and the loyalty of our customers with the phrase strong customer franchise. Now, our CEO did a double take on that one the first time we threw it at him, which is why we had some benchmarks ready. Because the thing is, that really is the term of art that maps that concept in Anglo financial reporting. And BCV's translators are specialized enough to know it. And then, you know, because we're using that more authentic field specific terminology that professionals, that market observers are used to, they're more likely to pick it up. 
So you'll get a credit agency saying that. In communications, what just happened there is known as moving from, er from owned to earned. And it's good. Now, as a translator, when you can move the needle like that, you, you feel like you're really actively helping your firm execute the most effective communication possible across its languages. You feel like your work is producing results. And and, and it's basically because what's happened is, like your bosses, you now see translation as a means to an end. You see translation as part of a bigger picture. You do translation as part of a bigger picture. You know, is that a good translation of that? No. I mean, anybody can see that. There's a bunch of stuff missing. <laughs> but it's effective communication. And the head of wealth management at my bank thought so too because he was there in the meeting when we brainstormed it and figured it out. He has bought in, right? He's bought into the brochure and he's bought in to what you and your team are doing. And just what are you doing? You're executing on a process product model that does occasionally blur the lines between translation and writing, but it does so because blurring those lines once in a while is part and parcel of your fundamental approach to translating. And, and I'll leave you with this, those blurred lines and the face-to-face -face processes that underpin them mean that the machines probably aren't going to be coming for your job anytime soon. Thank you.